and in putting together the final pieces for his band, his gay band with a gay black lead singer, he added a touch that was also certainly not the popular cultural standard, his backup singers. After Sylvester had just auditioned two tall, thin, leggy blondes, in walked Martha Wash to audition for her shot. She was black, she was fat, and her vocals blew Sylvester away. His question to her was, do you know another woman who can sing as well as you and who is as big as you? Yes, she knew the woman. Martha Wash brought Isora Rhodes back to Sylvester and the two ladies got the gig. Sylvester had his backup singers who he named Two Tons of Fun. They are part of his legacy to dance music and I will get to them in a follow-up video. And here we are, as promised. I love that Sylvester took a chance on these two women. In retrospect, it seems completely logical that Sylvester would have wanted these women to sing with him because, well, they could sing very well. But in the world of pop music, singing is never just about singing. Beyond selling a sound, it is about selling a look. Women who looked like Martha Wash and Isora Rhodes rarely found major success outside of Christian music or gospel music because of the way that they looked. But these two women did find success in the popular music world, first as Two Tons of Fun, then later as The Weather Girls. Though most people who will tell their stories will say that they were one-hit wonders, they were able to ring out more than one hit. But even though they were more successful than people would give them credit for having been, they were not as successful as they could have been. And I think that 90% of that has to do with their weight because they were certainly not lacking in talent. Let's explore their story and take a look at the music industry and the role that beauty politics plays in it. If you like these videos about your favorite and most scandalous celebrities from yesteryear that make the Ty Said What Ty Said channel a time capsule for the culture, subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know every time I upload one of these videos or every time that I live stream and comment I subscribe in the comment section so that I can say hello to you. Now, on to why you are here. Before Sylvester introduced us to Two Tons of Fun, the two ladies were singing in gospel groups and choirs in California's Bay Area. Galveston, Texas native Isora Rhodes and San Francisco-born Martha Wash met when they were young. Martha Wash attended a Church of God in Christ, which was just an alley away from the Baptist church that Isora Rhodes was attending. Both ladies were very active in their church choirs as singers, while Isora Rhodes was the lead vocalist and pianist of San Francisco Inspirational Choir. They both eventually landed in a gospel group called NOW, News of the World. While performing part-time in News of the World, Martha also worked as a secretary for UC Hospital, while Isora worked as a bartender and a nurse assistant. She also worked as a piano and vocal teacher. In February 1976, Martha Watch took a step that would change the trajectory of their careers. She auditioned to be a backup singer for Sylvester. By the way, I made an amazing video about him. If you haven't seen it, you can see it here. Anyway, Sylvester was so impressed with Martha's vocal performance that he asked her if she knew another woman who could sing as well as she and who was equally large. She did know such a woman, and that woman was Isora Rhodes. Martha brought Isora to audition for Sylvester, and the rest was history. Sylvester called the two of them two tons of fun. The ladies had their first rehearsal with Sylvester in a Volkswagen, driving across the Golden Gate Bridge on their way to a gig. Two Tons of Fun debuted on Sylvester's self-titled third album, Sylvester, released in 1977. The duo sang backup vocals on the album's singles, Down, 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 and Over and Over, which charted at number 18 on the Billboard dance chart. In 1978, Sylvester released his fourth album, Step 2, which also featured the Two Tons of Fun background vocals throughout the album. Dance, Disco Heat, the album's lead single which featured the Two Tons of Fun, 
peaked at number one on Billboard's dance chart and became their first number one single on that chart. The album's second single, You Make Me Feel Mighty Real, also featured the duo and became their second number one single on the dance chart. In 1979, the duo secured their own record deal with Fantasy Records. Much to Sylvester's disappointment about their newly scored record deal, the duo began performing in fewer shows with Sylvester. In the same year, Two Tons of Fun sang background on Sylvester's live album, Living Proof, one of their final performances together. Fantasy Records released two albums by the duo, Two Tons of Fun and Back Atcha. The pair's debut included dance floor hits, I Got the Feeling, Just Us, Do You Want a Boogie, Huh?, and Earth Can Be Just Like Heaven. But for these women who had been singing practically since they could walk, and singing very well at that, why did it take them so long to secure a record deal of their own, especially if not having talent wasn't the problem? Can we not ignore the elephant in the room and have a quick, frank discussion about weight in the music industry? The fact is that whether we're talking the 1970s or the 2020s, women who are singers must first gain approval for their physical appearance before they are even judged based on their talent. If you can, and I think that you'll be able to, will you write in the comments section five women singers who look great but can't sing well? Go for it. Now, I realize that everyone's taste is different, but just humor me. I'll be very surprised to find any overweight women on any of your lists. Knowing this can make one wonder just what percentage of the talent industry is really about talent. Let's look at Jennifer Hudson as an example. Her voice really hasn't changed much since her days at American Idol. But do you recall how she became worthy of attention after she dropped several pounds from being on her Weight Watchers diet? We can pretend that her drastic weight loss had nothing to do with her newfound place in a better spotlight, but we'd be disingenuous in doing so. To drive the point further, you've already answered my question about thin, attractive women who can't sing well, but manage to have successful singing careers. Now answer this question. Who are five fat women who can't sing well who have had successful music careers? I'd be very surprised if you can name even one let alone five. All of that to say, perhaps Martha and Isora could have gone much further in their music careers had they been considered to be physically attractive by popular culture beauty standards. It's sad enough knowing that the ladies never got the success that their talent warranted, but to add to that, the ladies also had problems with their fat and jolly images. See some things that they had to say in this Ebony Magazine article from June of 1981. Now, I'm just going to read a few snippets of the article, but if you want it, you can definitely find it online. I'll start here. Quote from the article, The women have gotten as much mileage out of being hefty as Jane Kennedy has out of her looks. Although they decline to reveal their exact weight or age, apparently it isn't a big deal to either of them. Quote, my weight has never hindered me. I played basketball and football with my kids when I weighed 370 pounds, says Mrs. Armstead, throwing back her head in laughter. But I knew it was time to go on a diet when Sylvester had to sew two sheets together for me because it was the only thing I could get into. Miss Wash, the younger of the duo, says, The question isn't how I cope now, but how would I cope being a small person? I've been heavy all my life. See how the writer is basically saying that they are as fat as Jane Kennedy is pretty, and that is the cause for their success? And can we get to the sentence about the ladies declining to reveal their exact age or weight? Why on earth would someone's weight be a question? And later in the article, we are told that it's their sizes and not their voices that make an impression on people. When the article reads, quote, but the tons don't need to open their mouths to make an impression. All they have to do is walk out on the stage, as they did recently at Berkeley Community Theater near San Francisco." End quote. And here, 
You will see that Izora is completely aware of her size and even self-conscious about it, but these are issues that are not typically discussed when we're reading a write-up about a music artist who is not fat. One of her quotes in the article says, when you are really big and you know you are big, you don't want anything that calls attention to the bulges or curves, says the mother of seven children who isn't always concerned about putting on makeup and wigs. When I step off that stage, I'm just plain mama. I like it better that way. And here we get to the most frank part of the discussion about their weight. The article reads, Despite their reputation as two jolly fat women, the two tons would like to lose some weight. Carrying around their tonnage, as Wash jokingly refers to it, is not, they know, good for their health. Mrs. Armstead has been plagued by medical problems and has to take medication for asthma and everything else. Martha Wash said, Sometimes I feel obese. Other times I just feel very overweight. I'm getting better about eating vegetables, which I never used to like. Meanwhile, Mrs. Armstead has shed 25 pounds in two months by eliminating cakes and cookies from her diet and not eating anything after 9 p.m. What would happen to their image if they ever became thin? Well, Mrs. Armstead says, smiling, mulling over the question, we could use pillows for padding. But Miss Wash has another idea. We'll drop the name The Tons and just call ourselves Fun." End quote. Why is it that they are said to have a reputation for being fat and jolly, but not a reputation for being two powerhouse vocalists? Unfortunately, the health problems that were caused by her weight would end up catching up to Miss Isora Rhodes in the end. Their weight was a part of who they were, but it would seem that an article about music artists might highlight their music more than their weight. This article did not do that. And the Jet magazine that focuses on Martha and Isora from the same month and year is even worse than this Ebony article. It is full of fat jokes, puns and innuendos and is a cringe-worthy read. You can check it out for yourself. You will find that this is not an article praising two amazing singers. This is an article about two fat women. And if you tell me that this article is written for anything other than high comedy, I'm calling you a liar. Much of any writing that you would find about the two tons of fun during their career in the early 1980s pokes fun at their sizes and leads the readers to believe that the two ladies are comfortable with and even embrace the fat and jolly trope assigned to them by society. But when you read for yourself what the ladies had to say in the Ebony article from June of 1981, you know that there was something deeper going on behind the smiles that they put on when people made fat jokes about them. But despite all of that, they were still successful the fact that so much was taken from them during their careers is why their legacies should not be distorted or undersold. They were more than one-hit wonders, literally, and in a lot of music circles, they are considered the godmothers of dance music. So let's get on with how they earned this legacy. On January 24th, 1980, the duo released their debut self-titled album, Two Tons of Fun. The album spawned two top five dance singles, Earth Can Be Just Like Heaven, and I Got the Feeling. Shortly after the release of the album, they changed their name to The Two Tons after being informed that an Oklahoma Gospel Act had already registered the group name Two Tons of Fun with ASCAP back in 1958. Their second album was called Back At Ya, and it was released later that same year. The album spawned a single called I Depend On You that peaked at number 72, on the dance chart. The follow-up single, Never Like This, peaked at number 55 on the R&B chart. 1982 would be their most successful year ever, as the two ladies moved to Columbia Records and changed their names once again. Now, Two Tons would be known as The Weather Girls. They released their first and biggest hit record under that moniker, It's Raining Men. Written by musician Paul Schaefer, best known as being the band leader of the now defunct Late Show with David Letterman and the late actor, singer, songwriter, producer, Paul Jabara. It's Raining Men debuted at number one on the Billboard Disco Dance Chart 
and number 34 on the R&B chart in late 1982. And early the following year, it peaked at number 46 on the Billboard Hot 100. But it became an even bigger hit outside of the United States. In New Zealand, it peaked at number 13, number 8 in Norway. It peaked at number 5 in Ireland, and in the UK it peaked at number 2 on their Top 40s chart and remained on the chart for 16 weeks. Shortly after its release, it sold over 6 million copies worldwide. Its Raining Men also received a nomination at the 26th Annual Grammy Awards in 1983 for Best R&B Performance by a Duo or Group. Its Raining Men would be the height of their success, and the downward slope afterwards was a steep and fast one. On January 22, 1983, they released their third album called Success, and it was just about anything but successful. Despite how well the album's lead single performed, the overall album experienced very mild success. The album's title track, Success, was released as the second single and peaked at number 89 on the R&B chart. Two additional singles called I'm Gonna Wash That Man Right Out of My Hair and Dear Santa were also released but failed to chart at all. And just like that, as fast as their superstardom came, it left. The dismal numbers for the ironically titled Success Album and two more flop albums, one produced in part by Full Force, caused Columbia Records to drop the Weather Girls from the label. Now it's worth mentioning that during their descent phase at Columbia, the Weather Girls got to be a part of something that was kind of a big deal for any music artist in 1984. Everyone wanted to work with Michael Jackson, and the Weather Girls got that opportunity when Michael Jackson produced the song Centipede for his oldest sister, Rebe Jackson. The background vocals on that song were provided by Michael Jackson and the Weather Girls. The bridge on that song that sends chills up your spine is sung by none other than Martha Wash. The song reached number four on the R&B charts. Because of their biggest hit, the pair has often been called a one-hit wonder throughout the decades. But if you've been listening, you know that they had other hits on R&B, dance, and pop music charts. So at the very least, right here, we can lay to rest and dispel the mainstream notion that Martha and Isora were one-hit wonders. After getting dropped from their label, the ladies stayed together for a few more years as the Weather Girls, but with no more big breaks in sight, the Weather Girls split up professionally, but they did remain friends. Isora Armstead went on to relocate to Frankfurt, Germany, where she reformed the Weather Girls along with her daughter, Dinelle. The newer Weather Girls released three albums called Double Tons of Fun, Think Big, and Putting on the Hits. They also toured extensively throughout Europe. They even tried to represent Germany for the Eurovision Song Contest, but their final song called Get Up didn't make it to the final round. Through Isora, the Weather Girls went on to perform and record but there was never a more successful and popular lineup of the duo act than Martha Wash and Isora Rhodes. In August of 2004, Isora left Germany to return to California in order to undergo medical treatment for some heart-related complications. A month later, her tonnage, as it had been called in the Ebony article, had gotten the best of her, and on September 16, 2004, she died from heart failure in San Leandro, California at the age of 62, leaving behind her seven children and many grandchildren. May she rest in peace. But the Weather Girls Act still lives on through Isora's bloodline. Isora's daughter, Dinelle Rhodes, initially continued the act alongside her cousin, Ingrid Arthur. Ingrid was a Weather Girl from 2006 to 2012. The current lineup is Dinelle Rhodes and Dory Lynn Lyles, who has been a weather girl since 2012. They are far from being mainstream, but they are popular in Europe and especially with gay audiences. Meanwhile, after splitting from the duo, Martha Wash went on to have a very prolific singing career of her own, but whether or not the former weather girl had a successful career is up for debate. 
we will get into all of that in the next video. As for the legacy of the Weather Girls, their biggest hit song remains the biggest part of their legacy. It's Raining Men has ranked number 47 on Billboard's 50 Best Gay Anthems of All Time, number 35 on VH1's Greatest Dance Songs, as well as number 35 on VH1's One Hit Wonders, number 12 on Paste Magazine's 60 Best Dance Floor Classics, and number 2 on the Gay UK's Top Gay Anthems for Pride. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Ty Said What Ty Said channel. Please leave a thumbs up and comment so that we can get a discussion going. And share this video on all of your social media, especially your Facebook. That really helps me out a lot. And subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you can know when my next video is ready for you. And if you don't like what I'm saying, but you love it, feel free to hit that applaud button just below your video screen there and send me some donations, donations, donations. Yeah, baby. See you on the next video. If you have a business, product, service, YouTube channel, or social media account that you would like to promote on my channel, email me at taiwan at taisaidwhattaisaid.com or use the submission form on my website, taisaidwhattaisaid.com, to get rates for advertising on my community tab, my live streams, and or my edited videos, just like this one. Now, this video started with a promise, and I'm ending it with a promise. To new channel subscriber, Lisa Lisa Willie, congratulations on winning your earrings from Nisi's Etsy company. By the time you hear this, your package will already be on the way to you, and I hope that you enjoy your beautiful earrings, and I hope that you enjoy your time here on the Ty Said What Ty Said channel. See you on the next video, everyone.